and uh, welcome everyone to the Tortoise AI Summit and to this second session on the environmental footprint of artificial intelligence, um, whether that's a, a cause for, for concern or in fact, in some ways, a cause for optimism. Um, to explain that, in, in almost every conversation we've had with our Tortoise AI network members at our thinkings um, and places we've talked about the adoption of artificial intelligence, someone's always raise the question of carbon. Um, how can we better use AI to address climate change? How can we uh, curb the negative effects of the increased energy use from computing and from artificial intelligence and, and from data centers? Um, and also potentially tackle the consumption that's being driven by learning algorithms that target us with increasingly effective advertising. Um, so uh, it's a really important topic, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing it. I'm, I'm Luke Bedimer. I'm a reporter at Tortoise, um, and I'm really, really lucky to have a panel that's actually just packed <laughs> with expertise um, and a diversity of perspectives and uh, people who can really talk about this topic from a variety of angles to help us as Tortoise decide how we should be thinking about it in future. Um, so I'm joined by, by Lucy Yu, who's the Chief Exec at the Centre for Net Zero, Jack Corbo, who I believe will be joining in just a moment, who's the co-founder and Chief Scientist at Quantum Black, Siraj Kalik, um, an investment partner at Atomico and Buffy Price, who is the co-founder and COO at Carbon Re. Um, I also very much hope that um, CF Hamid, who's the, the CEO of Altruistic, um, will be able to join us and, and give his thoughts, as well as David Rolnick. Um, who's the co-founder and chair of Climate Change AI, as well as a, a professor at McGill University. Um, importantly, though, I would love to hear from everybody else in the virtual room that the, the Tortoise AI Summit is a brilliant opportunity for us as journalists to learn more about these key topics um, and think about the ways that we should cover them in future, not just with our uh, journalism, but also with the data work that we do and the global AI index, which, um, which we've just heard a bit about in the previous session. So um, everyone, please, please chime in. Uh, this is a, a topic that people um, could possibly have at front of mind at the moment with COP26 uh, just in, in the rearview mirror. Um, and the fact that it affects just so many of us. Um, my colleague Patricia Clark will be will be in the chat um, looking out for people's ideas and, and questions. So without further ado, we, we've we've playfully called this session uh, is artificial intelligence an eco friend or an eco foe? Um, and I think in reality, whilst we meant that there was a distinction between harm to the environment and doing good for the environment, it's going to be more complicated than that. Um, so it would be great to start if we could, um, possibly with with um, Buffy Price, sim simply because your work at Carbonry, I think, falls quite squarely into the eco friend side of that equation. Um, it would be great if yeah, you could explain a bit about what, what you've been doing and, and perhaps how that fits into the bigger picture for, for using artificial intelligence to tackle tackle climate issues. Yes, very much so. So we are um, directly applying our AI to tackle uh, the problems of carbon emissions. So it's very much how, how, how and where you direct that use. Um, so at Carbon Ray, we're developing um, an AI powered platform that reduces carbon emissions targeted at um, energy intensive industries such as cement and steel. And those count for like 20% of uh, emissions globally so they're a huge um, emitter and haven't uh, um, really been uh, tackled um, in terms of um, uh, emissions in the same way that um, they've had other other um, other industries have been focused on so we are really focusing on uh, optimization process optimization through AI um, and our models can reduce um, carbon emissions in, in cement um, by sort of up to 20% of fuel derived, derived emissions. So the, the global impact of those um, algorithms can be, be huge. Um, we are um, focusing on, on cement in the first instance, but the, the advantage of the AI is that it can be deployed at speed and at scale. So once those algorithms are trained, in practice, we can then deploy those across multiple plants and multiple geographies and really scale that impact. And that's really what um, the AI can, can help us do. Yeah. 
Um, so it's interesting to hear. And um, I think when when we were scoping out this conversation, yeah. the word optimization came up a lot. Um, yeah. There was the idea that we've got this big sort of l legacy of high carbon infrastructure. Um, and I think it was you actually, Buffy, told me that a lot of the digitization had taken place but the, the optimization hadn't. And I wondered if, if there was, and I could also bounce this to Lucy, I think. Um, Buffy, I wonder if um, you could say a little bit about like how, how you've, uh, how you're addressing the, the, the cement example that you gave to, to, to optimize where um, before there were, there were some real issues. Yes, I mean, the advantage of the in, uh, initiatives like uh, Industry, Industry 4.0 means that there is a lot of data um, and these processes, um, but they, you know, so far they've been um, uh, not, not been leveraged to the uh, the maximum opportunity, and that's partly because you know these, these um, cement producers don't have in-house teams of data analysts and, and people able to to delve into that data. But what we've um, been able to, to to derive from that is that um, you know cement plants, just like just anybody, has has a good day and a bad day. So there's there's days where um, the, the, the cement production and the fuel use is optimal and, you know, bad days when you're putting much more energy into the system to have the same amount of output. And what we're able to do is um, analyse that data and um, make recommendations for the, for the um, plant operator to implement, to keep a human in the loop in our, with our solution um, to ensure that um, the energy use is uh, performing at the best of days um, every every day. That's that's what that's the yeah. ideal and, outcome, and, that, and that's the that's the optimization process. Yeah. At, yes, at exactly. And that, um, that's the that first first part that we're tackling. And and the the you know we're seeing sort of huge, huge amounts of variation, and there are all all sorts of levers and parameters that um, you yeah. know cement plant operator is unable to sort of keep keep track on, track on and we're able to drive, derive insights that were previously sort of showing indicators or, 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 or drivers of that variation that might not have been um, uh, available otherwise. Yeah, um, it, it's really interesting to hear. I, th I think um, the, the theme for me has become this op optimization one, at least for now, because um, that's one of the biggest tasks ahead of us in, in reaching net zero. Um, because there's a, a huge amount of, of legacy infrastructure that needs to be used more effectively. Um, and Lu Lucy, that feels like a great uh, qu question to put to you. How, how widely should and could this process of optimization through AI go? And your, your experience with um, en energy and uh, smart grid uh, balancing would be a, an interesting sort of aspect of that, would it not? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, I mean, maybe just building on some of the points that that Buffy made. Um, so, so what what we kind of think of and consider as the energy system today, or, or maybe in, in the past decade or so, is very different from what we will think of as as the energy system in the future. So, um, maybe to, to give an analogy, if you have a spare bedroom in your house today, you you probably don't consider that you're part of the global hotel network, but um, you effectively could be if you if you joined one of a, a number of platforms uh, that exist today. Uh, now, if you own an, an electric vehicle today, um, or maybe an electric heat pump, or a, a smart thermostat, or any of these um, uh, low carbon technologies, distributed energy resources, you probably don't consider them today as being part of the energy system, but they will certainly be a fundamental part of that system in the future. And they will all be um, not just uh, consuming electricity, but also potentially um, providing it back into the grid mm -hmm. um, and potentially also storing it as well. So um, we will have a huge network of these um, distributed decentralized devices, um, all with a range of different uh, possible actions within the system. And um, uh, as you said, Luke, actually really being op able to optimize the behavior of all, all of these devices in a way that keeps the system balanced um, so keeps that uh, balance between the demand side and the supply side. And of course, as we move to more renewables to generate on the supply side, uh, we introduce more uh, in, inherent uh, intermittency in generation, which is why these properties of flexibility of short and long term storage become more important yeah. in uh, orchestrating this, this whole system and keeping it in balance. And I think... Um, 
today because we're right at the start of that journey um, many people won't have these things in their homes or if they do have them in their homes they're probably using them in quite an analog or quite a manual way so if, okay. if you have a smart thermostat I'd, I'd love to know those people who are really using it maybe quite like it was intended and those who are still fiddling with the little box on the wall or whatever um, but the way that this is certainly heading is that we will see um, much more automation to orchestrate yeah. all of these different devices and um, use of AI. And that's so I was just about that's where the the sort of the critical part for the use of AI comes in. But in your description, there's a, there are many more ingredients there than simply AI tools. Um, it, I th it would be interesting to to dwell on the eco friend side of things um, just for a bit longer because I think those are two really helpful examples. I wonder, um, Giacomo, if I could um, come to you to ask about what is there beyond optimization? So beyond optimizing the the systems we've already got, what what other promises are there? I guess in in the sort of suite of AI capabilities emerging at the moment to to really do do good for for the planet. Um, I think it's a question of optimization, but I think it's also a question of virtualization. Um, there's, you know, if you think about carbon intensive processes, there are physical processes, there are things that, you know, take place in the real world, you know, and that's true across any number of industries and in any number of application areas, whether, you know, I'm, I'm a farmer company and, in the context of drug discovery, I'm carrying out um, a wet lab, you know, bench experiments, or I'm running a clinical trial and I'm, you know, I'm standing up, I have people in different parts of the world at different sites, recruiting patients, like anything that takes place in the, or I'm on auto, automotive OEM and I'm carrying out physical testing. I have to create prototypes. I have to road test these things. I have to test out an engine on a dyno or, or on a track. Uh, anything that takes place in the real world, you know, is, is carbon intensive. One of the very big opportunities, I, I think, for machine learning and AI, like, it, are things that are enhancing our simulation capabilities. And better simulation capabilities mean that they offset, they obviate the need to carry out physical testing. Mm. And so, you know, as much as we might talk about the optimization opportunities and things that take, you know, help us have um, more, more automation, more you know, self-driven systems, move individuals into management by exception models, like all of that is great. All of that will you know, le lends itself to greater optimization, moving into a next optimization horizon. I, I think that's great. But in the first place, and maybe a lot of those optimization opportunities are also predicated on better simulation capabilities. And the simulation capabilities it, like, are the things that are you know, pretty amazing. And, they, and again, the, the, this is something that's happening in so many different contexts, right? Like it's, it's happening, just think, of, um, just think of AlphaFold and AlphaFold Multimer, right? And all the things that are happening around uh, machine learning for drug discovery and our ability to be able to say something about a, how a chemical compound, compound will, will behave under certain conditions. I think everything around, you know, this is an area that we were tremendously excited about, which is take any multi-physics simulation, anything that, you know, where the geometry, the 3D geometry modulates the behavior of the, the physics itself, whether we're talking about, about electromagnetic field simulation, whether we're talking about computational fluid dynamic simulation, like these are things increasingly where, you know, we can create high fidelity, you know, approximations of the heavy compute physics via, you know, a deep learning model, via some, some kind of machine learning model, in which case I'm, I'm doing two things. One, I'm getting to things that are replay, like allow me to do much more virtual simulation, much more in a virtual environment that offsets mm -hmm. the physical stuff. But two, allows me to do a lot more and more quickly and to optimize things to a degree that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Yeah, yeah, that's a really helpful point. I, I'd love to um, go back to Lucy and then to David, um, just because they've got their hands up. And there's a, there are two really, really excellent points from Sam and Rich in the chat. So look to bring them in. But Lucy, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Luke. 
uh, quickly, two two points to uh, Yakame's comments. Um, one is just to to say I used to work for a company uh, that was developing autonomous driving software, and um, you know, really a lot of the end game for that company was trying to get to the point where a lot of that could be done in a virtual environment, so it could be done through simulation. Um, we started off actually doing some stuff in, with a real vehicle on real roads. Um, the amount of compute we were using was literally just like having uh, several kettles boiling continuously in the back of the vehicle, because these were calculations that uh, we didn't have the right infrastructure to have low enough latency to send information back into the cloud and compute in the cloud. So we were having mm. to do them on the vehicle. So um, totally um, uh, back up Yakomo's point there. The other point though, I think really, um, uh, I've been watching the World Chess Championships recently, they're on at the moment. and. Um, it really got me thinking about a few years ago when uh, DeepMind, uh, the AlphaGo uh, program, actually managed to beat the, the world's best player, mm -hmm. Lee Sedol. And um, uh, what really struck me about that is one of the moves that it made was a kind of, it was almost described at the time as being a, not a human move. So a very, very kind of counterintuitive move. And similarly, uh, you know, chess, obviously, there are lots of great programs now where you can play a computer. and. Uh, you know, there's almost this idea in chess of what's a human move and what's a Silicon Valley move. And that means, you know, a, a move that you would only have come up with through uh, through other routes. So it wouldn't mm. be the result of a kind of a logical human kind of thinking through, thinking through process. Um, and so I suppose um, I also just maybe wanted to interject and say, uh, while I think artificial intelligence uh, in applications like drug discovery, those sorts of things has huge potential, I do also think in certain types of context and when there is still a, a human in the in the loop or in the system somewhere who has to sort of almost uh, review, scrutinize the, the sort of the, the guidance or the, the outputs of the artificial intelligence and then take some action based upon them. I think, mm. you know, that still leaves room for um, perhaps discomfort or um, just uh, different challenges in terms of translating that back into the real world. Yeah. What so what what you said another thing you mentioned there that seemed very interesting to me was this idea of the unexpected move in the game. Um and quite often the climate challenge, the climate crisis agenda is talked about like a, we're we're in we're sort of competing, right, with this and um it's interesting to me to consider whether there are some unexpected moves that humans wouldn't think to make but perhaps intelligent systems or computer systems uh, uh at play in parts of this of the overall agenda in energy and uh, material manufacture, as Buffy mentioned, um, might think to do that we wouldn't. Um, extremely, thanks a lot, Lucy. So I, I would love to go to David um, just uh, because it would be great to give him a chance to respond to what's been said before we try and move on. Because um, I'd, I'd love, obviously, to get to the eco faux side of the conversation. I'd also really like to to speak to Siraj about. Um, the investment attitudes that he's seeing and and whether uh, the eco friend side of this debate is really framing how investors are, are, are put where where investors are putting their money. But um, David, it, uh, it's great to to have you join us. What what have you got to say? Thank you so much. Um, I completely agree with what um, everyone else has has already said. Um, I want to add another another theme to the to the discussion. Um, I think that Buffy has already talked about um, the many opportunities for, for optimization uh, as one theme for AI in the context of climate change. And we can see that across lots of different contexts uh, from optimization of industrial HVAC systems to industrial processes to free transportation and supply chains. Um, I think Lucy has already talked about um, uh, some examples of, of forecasting. So this is another overarching theme that we see, uh, whether that's in um, now casting for supply um, in the context of balancing uh, electrical grids with variable uh, generators, uh, solar and wind power varying a lot, um, predicting demand that also helps balance uh, electrical grids. And there are a lot of other situations where forecasting can be useful. Uh, for example, in um, the context of, of crop yield and trying to avert food insecurity. Um, for, for climate change adaptation. Um, and then Giacomo's uh, brought up the, the really important area of accelerated science and scientific discovery, uh, speeding up complicated physical models, maybe uh, speeding up the process of, of discovering new materials uh, that could be useful in batteries, catalysts, uh, carbon sorbents, mm -hmm. a bunch of other, bunch of other contexts. 
Um, I'd like to bring in one more theme, which is data gathering. In a lot of contexts, we simply don't have data to make informed decisions. And that is often the situation with um, remote sensing technologies or NLP technologies where, uh, for example, we don't know where built infrastructure is, what emissions it's associated with, uh, what um, vulnerabilities there are in infrastructure to climate relevant impacts. We don't necessarily know where deforestation is happening and changes in land use um, or what the emissions are uh, associated with individual places and, uh, and activities. Um, there are huge initiatives ongoing for these kinds of things like uh, the, the Climate Trace Coalition for Monitoring Emissions or the Mapping the Andean Amazon Project for Tracking Deforestation um, in uh, South America. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of these situations where machine learning is really being key in gathering data to make informed decisions by policymakers or other decision makers. In the context of NLP, you can also imagine doing this with large textual corpora parsing that, for example, corporate financial disclosures for yeah. climate relevant information. Uh, so I wanted to just bring that up as, as the, the other, the fourth theme that we see. I can drop a, a link in the chat to, to our overall taxonomy for, for how these things can be thought about. Yeah, I, I mean, just to push on one of those last points, because I, I did um, a, a bit of work on a climate related financial disclosure, et cetera. Um, how, how realistic do you think that prospect is in, in years to come that we'll see, uh, and AI may well be a part of this, but passing um, information, as you mentioned, but see um, tools of that kind used to, I guess, verify the climate commitments and, and sort of appraise the climate related activities of businesses um, going forward. So I, I think that one should be optimistic, but cautious. Um, AI is not in general going to be able to make the kind of informed decisions that a human would be able to do. It's going to be able to pick out relevant information very fast and speed up the labeling process um, that a human would find too time intensive to do. But ultimately, one will want to have a human in the loop um, from a trust perspective and also from yeah. a capabilities perspective as an AI researcher. The technologies aren't there to sort of make decisions on behalf of humans in, in broad contexts that require an understanding of society. Um, they're really more designed for making decisions or predictions in very constrained environments where we understand exactly yeah. what, what the data setting is. It's, uh, it's so interesting. I, I, David, David Woods put a point in the chat that I think relates quite closely to this, and it would be great to, to have him make it. Um, but just before we do, Buffy, you were you were nodding your head quite vigorously to David's point about data collection um, and, and applications for data collection. I wondered if if, if you had something to um, to say on that front. Well, broadly, I mean, obviously, with our technology, any um, organisation that doesn't, any cement plant uh, or manufacturer that doesn't um, collect that data at the moment um, is, uh, we, we can't apply our technology to. So, so that's something that just fundamentally needs to change. Mm -hmm of um, learning and, and building our deep reinforcement learning algorithms, we need to, to, to get as much data as we can. And so there are sort of hesitancies around sharing data and uh, making that like, available, mobilize the use of um, you know, ready available um, algorithms and, and making that data, so de democratizing the data really is maybe- Yeah, but do you, do, you find, do you find there's a hesitancy even in the sort of industrial context that you work with you mentioned that there, that there was cement material manufacture still etc is there is there still a, a sort of resistance there we've actually been you know really uh, pleasantly surprised about the um the risk appetite for for right. a young startup um particularly in our on our pilot projects that they are generally outside of um the uk and the eu um very much more um in asia so I think it's it's a geographical appetite and I think there is sort of still that sort of legacy of our data is worth something to us and to people holding 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 on to it. Yeah. And that has been something that's sort of been um, you know, driven by, you know, the success of, you know, the Googles of the world, but you know, that's that's how they made their money. Yeah. So um th th I think there's there's some sort of psychological behavioral sort of um issues to to deal with there. And also, you know, in the UK we have um there are sort of data regulations around sharing information across cement plants. And mm -hmm. that impact the, the algorithms but that does sort of build in sort of maybe some element of mistrust or, or concern about just making a, giving away the data yeah interesting um thank you very much so so david it would be great to hear from you and then I, we must get uh siraj's thoughts um on this are you david are you there Excellent. yes i am 
So I was very impressed by the list that uh, uh, the other David Romnick just posted in ways in which AI could uh, change our thinking about climate change. Mm -hmm. I like the suggestion of finally making a nuclear fusion a reality. We've been expecting nuclear fusion within 20 years since I think 1955 was the first time that prediction was made. And it's always been 20 years away, except mm -hmm. that now it looks a lot closer because not only do we have a better understanding of high temperature semiconductors and new configurations for plasma, but we have AI that could monitor the parameters in real time and design. So I like that suggestion. I also like the suggestion that the AI could provide a better understanding of the models of the tipping points within the climate, things that will help us to understand with more confidence how close we are to even more serious runaway changes. So uh, I, I'm very pleased to see that. And I, I'm glad that uh, we're not just looking at what we can do today, but what we might yeah. do very differently in the near future. Excellent. And you, you made a point about um, get, getting beyond what humans would suggest in, in reaching net zero, um, and also the, the issue of, of the tipping points and cascades and feedback cycles, cycles, etc. Is that kind of wrapped in the point you've just made about new types of thinking, fusion as part of it, but other potential horizons that we might sort of get over? That's right. We, we've seen recently from DeepMind, for example, it's had uh, new ways of thinking about protein folding. And even yeah. today, it was announced new ways of tackling various mathematical problems in a creative way, not just a better computation, but actually coming up with new suggestions. So the same kind of application into the field of uh, climate modeling and climate solutions, I think, yeah. uh, has a big potential. So I'd like to see uh, big industry and government investment into exactly that possibility. Yeah, well, excellent segue, I suppose, to, to the question that I wanted to pose to, to Siraj uh, around investment and, and what needs to happen to, to drive some of these solutions forward. And then I'd, I'd love if we could to go to, to Saif uh, Hamid, um, who, who I believe is with us, although I can't see his face in a box anymore. So I hope I hope we've still got you, Saif. But um, Siraj, yeah, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, there's there's been a lot already. Um, uh, what, what would you like to say? Can we un unmute Siraj, please? Thank you. Yeah, that's nice. I was muted, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of, of, of um, the way we think about things has been covered already, but maybe just to bring it all together. So uh, Atomico is a fund that, um, you know, I think uh, looks at uh, VC investing as something as um, more than just returns for investors, but that returns are correlated with solving uh, planet scale problems and purpose and returns are correlated. So I've been lucky in my role as a frontier technology focused partner to focus on you know, many of the topics we've discussed. But the way you know we look at these, um, you know, broadly, I think we've got our own set of four things that this breaks down to. You know, one is obviously optimizing resource utilization. We've talked about that, but you know, just taking one example of that data centers. Uh, DeepMind was able to optimize the data centers um, in, in a test uh, to re reduce energy use by 40%. And, you know, I think you had a pie chart before the session started on how mm. that's almost a quarter of uh, world energy use. So, you know, 40% of that is, you know, 10%. And that's the scale of taking an America off of off of the, the list of polluters. So that's huge by itself, but the list goes on, you know? So mm. um, there's just how we pool resources and get more out of it in ways that you couldn't really plan as a human being with a spreadsheet. So that's, you know, optimizing resource utilization. The second one is uh, chemistry and innovation. So um, this gets really interesting when you couple AI and quantum computing, and you can start to come up with new chemicals, uh, perovskites, new catalysts for carbon sequestration and so on. Um, one of the companies we backed, Fabric Nano, um, is using um, AI and several other novel modeling techniques to come up with chemicals without using petrochemicals. So a much more sustainable way of producing your everyday materials. Uh, you know, that's huge. We kind of take for granted everything around us and don't think about the impact of it often. And, you know, here is uh, an AI-based company that is solving that. Um, so that's the second one, chemistry and innovation. The third one is biology and agriculture. So my, the startup that I built before becoming a VC was in the agriculture space. And there's just been tremendous progress on things like, you know, disease detection for crops or, you know, in, improving supply chains and reducing spoilage um, uh, and so on. So just the, the way ag tech is impacted, you know, is not to be underestimated, just the 
footprint of, of yeah. just what we consume and how that can be optimized. And then the, the fourth category, which I think we also touched on a little bit earlier, was transparency and policing. There's just no way we can you know, look at satellite imagery and detect where deforestation is happening with human beings looking at that, right? You, you need yeah. to be able to use computer vision uh, to do that. Something like Planet Labs has, has got a project on with Human Rights Watch, for example, to look for uh, warning signs and flag that to human beings. So, so uh, you know, these these are very much covered. There is one thing that David said that you know I, I just want to come back to, which I think it said uh, humans are still going to be necessary, and I think in almost every case, AI is a tool, you know, to find correlations. But then that's kind of where it stops. Um, I do think that closed loop systems. You're right; it's early, but closed loop systems are starting to be more of a reality. If you look at data centers, when you're trying to reduce energy usage, it has to be a closed loop system. Your AI has to recommend that you turn off this fan or turn on this one, right? Depending on what's going on. So, you know, that is a closed loop system. That's an that's a entirely AI based optimization that doesn't need humans. And I think we'll see more of those as well. You know, you could imagine um, uh, robotics plus wet labs, and you can come up with new pharmaceuticals, new chemistry entirely in a closed loop AI driven system. Um, or you know, automatic flags for deforestation and so on that don't, don't require humans to be involved. We will get there. I think you're right that it's early, but eventually I do think that there'll be cases specifically where AI can act in a closed loop manner and, yeah. and much quicker and better than humans would ever be able to do. Tremendous. Um, well, there's a, there's a lot there as well. I, I would love to go to Saif um, now just to give him, give him a chance to weigh in um, and then if possible, there was, I, I do also want to get to this question of sort of what's the other side, what, what's the, the flip side of this debate. Um, but Saif, uh, please, please do let us know what you've been thinking. And thanks for thanks for joining us. Yeah, of course. No, thank you very much. Look, very happy to be here. Maybe just by way of brief introduction. So I'm the CEO of Altruistic. Altruistic is a company that helps large enterprises to measure and manage their environmental impact. So for example, if you're buying something and moving it from A to B. We measure what type of vehicle, what type of fuel, what type of distance, what type of material. And then we build up, for example, an emissions number, and then we start matching interventions against those different data points to help you break that number down. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for us, um, AI is definitely a very benign Frankenstein's monster and that it does more good than bad. Uh, but just for the purpose of playing a bit of a devil's advocate sort of role, let, let's focus a little on the bad. Uh, there, there are two particular uh, challenges, I think, or two particular examples of one challenge. And I think the challenge is that we tend to use AI uh, in situations where we, we know the variables or we try and constrain the variables to something that we understand. The problem with ESG and sustainability is that we just don't really understand a lot of the variables enough. So two examples, one is within the environmental column, let's say, and the other is overlapping the environmental and social columns. So if you look at within the environmental column, if we try to optimize purely for emissions, uh, you would switch all packaging formats to plastics uh, because plastics, for example, are lower emissions than glass, they're lower emissions than aluminum, they're lower emissions than steel when you look at a pure emissions footprint perspective. Now, obviously, reuse can change that, but if you take it, let's say, at, at a single use perspective, then you'll start switching over to plastics. Uh, you do then, however, create lots of other externalities. So, for example, ocean plastic is a problem that we really don't understand well enough. Uh, six or seven years ago, I was part of a large effort trying to quantify the amount of plastic going into the ocean and the impacts that it has further downstream in diet and you know, carcinogenic impacts and so on. We just really don't understand that space enough to start accelerating the impact in this hugely asymmetric risk reward situation. The second example that I kind of want to cite is when you start having this crossover between uh, environment and social, which gets even more complicated. So, for example, our customers tend to be large fashion companies, food companies, retailers, grocery, et cetera. If they start optimizing for an emissions lens, which is what all their stakeholders are pushing them to do, and in many ways, it's, it's, it's the right sort of push, uh, they would probably start shifting away from smaller vendors because smaller vendors tend to be higher emissions on a mm. per unit basis than larger vendors. They would also start prioritizing northern hemisphere vendors because then they rule out the logistics impact of Southern Hemisphere vendors. And again, Northern Hemisphere vendors tend to be more emissions efficient than Southern Hemisphere vendors. So you start creating this massive asymmetry. Yeah. If you look at mining, for example, in mining, there are two main ESG metrics that company tends, companies tend to look at. One is emissions, but the other is community relationships and community affairs. It's the mines license to operate that's at stake here. 
But again, if you start optimizing purely for emissions, you go towards increased mechanization, increased optimization of that mechanization. You start ruling out that community engagement that becomes so important to the mining companies licensed to operate. The trouble is when you start putting all of these into a model, the results often aren't actually what you need either for the business or for the, for, for the global ecosystem. I think the real challenge here is not just a data challenge, but it's also, we don't really know what we're measuring in a lot of these situations. And I think that the trouble is that the race and the acceleration, which frankly, our company is a beneficiary of towards more ESG efficiency, more ESG understanding, just runs the risk also of a massive, massive blip, uh, which can be hugely catastrophic for everyone concerned. Mm. Uh, it's an absolutely fascinating contribution. There's a lot there, and, and at least in part, those un, sort of unexpected um, implications as we try to build out the, the use of these models. Um, it reminded me a little bit of something that you said, um, Lucy, at least at the top, where um, we mentioned that this is an environmental but also a social uh, sort of compact, isn't it? And the, that we might run into some problems when we start to think about the eco faux side of things, about whether... AI works effectively in its in its wider context. Um, it would be great great to hear your thoughts on that, and I'd love to also give give Joanna the chance to to ask her question if if she's there. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, I mean, I think so we were chatting last night, and I was saying, I you know, I almost mm. think that we we need to so it, when we think about humans, we 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 consider a distinction almost between intelligence and, and emotional intelligence, and you know, we almost consider those as being very different traits and sort of characterizing themselves uh, in, in different ways. And I think um, maybe this comes back to this conversation about um, AI for sort of closed, closed loop systems cl uh, within a closed loop sort of environment. But I think the reality is in a lot of cases, we may, we may well also be trying to get our heads around how might we use this in applications that are not just um, uh, something that is quite transactional, where there's a sort of start mm. and a finish and a bit in the middle that needs doing, and that's where you can place your AI, and, and uh, there aren't necessarily what these wider social implications. So I think um, I don't necessarily have the answer to that, yeah. but I think it's a, it's an interesting space to be discussing. Yeah. Well, I, I, another interesting space certainly is is um, the idea of overconsumption, and, and part of the theme of this summit is accelerations, the, the various accelerations we've seen in not only the development of AI, but investment and populations and all, all this stuff. Um, I'd love to give Joanna the chance to ask her question and then maybe um, put that question of uh, using... Hi, hi there, Joanna. I'll, I'll hi. Let you... Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, so I actually work with a company and we upskill leadership audiences and other people in business on um, AI, machine learning and actually kind of training people as data analysts. Um, so a lot of what has already been covered, that is what we work with big business like FMCG, retail, pharmaceuticals on. Um, but I'm always in a kind of conflicted place of obviously you can use AI, machine learning and everything to optimize processes, but it doesn't really get to the root of the issue that we live in a world where we overconsume. So by, you know, working with big business, if they are able to optimize a certain process, um, automate something it, it ultimately leads them a lot of the time to being able to sell more create mm. more whatever it may be with that mission of kind of increasing gdp overall um so i was just kind of curious on on you know panelists thoughts anyone's thoughts around you know obviously we can optimize as much as we want but how do we get to the root issue of we do consume too much and that's actually what we need to focus on yeah. reducing yeah well i'd love to open that one to the floor um if, if anybody ha has ideas, Buffy, please, please go ahead. Um, well, really, just um, with a lot of criticism about using algorithms to, um, you know, encourage click through on ads, but um, presumably there's the equal opportunity to encourage better, more uh, sustainable decisions about our, our shopping habits, for example. So, you know, playing that same game to encourage better choices about what we, what we buy. So I just feel that there's you know, a, an untapped opportunity to mm. behaviour through, through the same mechanisms that we've, um, uh, like, yeah. assumption. It would be interesting to see the, the proof of that concept, if there is any. Um, Jack, Giacomo, and, um, if you want to want to chime in and then um, CF as well, it would be great to, to hear from you again. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, Joanna, I take your point, which is incredibly important, you know, around overconsumption, but it's, it's a, I feel like, 
it's a point whose scope is well beyond anything to do with machine learning, right? And its implications for, for sustainability. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard the argument even made like that, you know, when we're talking about one of the things that machine learning is absolutely, you know, driving are things that are helping to drive consumption, right? We have these devices that are increasingly effective at nudging us towards certain consumption patterns, right? Like, you know, we have ever more powerful recommender systems, right? Which are, even, you know, able to operate at scale, you know, have more and more data feeding into them about, you know, how we're behaving and, and all of, and should we handicap those things in those specific applications? I mean, I, I don't think so. Like, I think the overconsumption point, and maybe Saif, so this, this comes back to your point about, you know, I don't think it's so, so much a um, closed loop versus open loop argument or, um, or, you know, that we should have, you know, a singular metric by which we're optimizing things. Like the way in which I think uh, a lot of these problems should wash out and is, is maybe through pricing carbon. If there's, you know, there are externalities in play, like there are a number of points on the chat about the degree to which, you know, we shouldn't, the, the, those externalities to the extent that they're, they cut across enterprises, they cut across like regions of the world and national borders, then it really speaks to the fact that we have mechanisms in place which account for those externalities. And if you think about I don't think it's regulation about specific, you know, kinds of machine learning, nor is it about like trying to get the cloud providers to, you know, to do anything different, regulating that world, not regulating the infrastructure. It's about pricing carbon. Like, I feel like that is the purest mechanism through which we'll get optimization in the right areas. Um, CF, please, please, please do um, jump in on that one. Yeah, of course. I mean, Joanna's point is, is obviously very bold and at yeah. the heart of it is the conflict between God and mammon, right? It's the profit versus purpose conundrum at the heart of business. Do you do less emissions and therefore sell less? Or is there a way to have both? Uh, and naturally, all of our customers want to have both, for example, at Altruistic. And, and actually, we don't think you need to treat the two as separate. I mean, to Giacomo's point, we think you can, you can blend the two and actually start creating hybrid metrics that blend in carbon prices, for example, and IRRs to create carbon weighted IRRs. That helps you start to actually avoid the, the difficult conversation between finance teams and sustainability teams and say, let's just bring the two onto the same table and be fair and upfront about it. Now that may mean that we need a lower target than we had you know, earlier committed to the board or to our investors because a, a lower target means a lower, a lower carbon price, for example, right? Um, but, but ultimately you get all those points onto the same table. Our hypothesis is that there is a, a potential saving of anywhere from 30 to 40% across most of the companies we work with before you get to the point of selling less. And what we mean by that is an actual uh, saving in carbon intensity per unit, per unit of product, per unit of output, uh, per ingredient, before you need to say, well, let's sell fewer ingredients. Now, the great story is that actually when you focus on intensity per unit, you actually save cost as well, which means again, you get the mammon side plus God, which is which is the ideal mix for most of our customers, we feel. Mm -hmm. um, David, you got your hand up and I, I'm just conscious of coming towards the end of the session as well. So I wanna give give everybody a chance to respond. And I apologize that there, there's some really good contributions in the chat that we may not get to, but thanks for, for everyone who's weighed in, David and, and um, Paul Clark. Um, Dave Veronik, please, please uh, do go ahead. Thank you. So I think it's a really good point, and I want to sort of branch out into some of the other directions that we maybe haven't haven't gotten to to yet. I think that one of the challenges associated with thinking about uh, negative effects of, of AI and digital technologies more broadly is they're often considered extremely narrowly. You'll often see tech companies that are assuming that the impacts of their digital technologies are scope one and scope two emissions. So sort of the direct energy usage, for example, or maybe the hardware, but not thinking about what the algorithms are actually doing. And so, yes, I'm in very much in favor of, of carbon pricing, uh, helping to tackle these kinds of things. But one really needs to make sure that the pricing, whether it's, it's um, uh, voluntary by companies or um, ideally imposed uh, by governments, um, to, to put everyone in an even playing field is really accounting for scope three emissions. Mm -hmm. So whether that is algorithms that are designed to boost consumption or um, AI is being used extensively to facilitate 
oil and gas exploration and extraction. It's yeah. estimated to make half a trillion dollars for the fossil fuel industry uh, by 2025. Right, um, and so just realizing that we can have green algorithms that are run on green energy, but if they're doing something that's not green, then it's a little bit like having a, you know, a, a certified fair trade machine gun. If the, the, the ultimate goal of the thing matters often more than the, the, yeah. the energy that was used to, to make it. And that can be disproportionate for something that's as powerful and has a magnifier effect like AI. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really interesting contribution. Um, Siraj, please, please do uh, weigh in because I know you had a had a comment on on what's just been said, and then I'd love to, to hear from Saif and and, and Lucy yeah. if we can. No, I, mean, I, I think great, great commentary here. I think I mean this may be controversial, but I think the 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 ultimate at the bottom of it all is not there's nothing wrong with consumption per se. It's the unsustainability of it that's the problem, right? So, and, and it's also not new that people have been talking about overpopulation and issues. Malthus said this, you know, coming on a hundred years ago now. In the end, um, it's what we, uh, what the cost of our consumption is, what the decisions are. Uh, and uh, I think it's very much the case that some of the positives we talked about will lead us to be able to optimize our consumption in ways that in the end, yes, we may technically be consuming more, but now that's not coming, you know, plastics aren't coming from your oil anymore. They're coming from the biology that Fabric Nano has enabled, you know, mm. and it's actually using much less um, on a resource basis, even though technically we're consuming more iPhones or whatever it is, right? So we have to really think of, separate those two things. Uh, carbon tax is and always will be a great idea. I hope it happens, but, you know, I'm not holding my breath there. But, you know, in the end, what we have to put our energy behind is a lot of these positives we're talking about. I mean, we didn't all fly here for this meeting. We're doing it by Zoom, by digital infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, think about the savings on, on greenhouse gases. Maybe somebody here was recommended this event by recommender system, and they're going to go away and think about what they're hearing today and have a major impact, which, you know, is, is huge compared to the cost of the electrons, you know, going into this conversation. So in the end, yes, I, I think it's a real problem. I don't want to dismiss it. But I don't think our solution uh, will will get much by by kind of forcing people to consume less. I think mm -hmm. hopefully that will happen anyway, based on transparency and awareness. Um, but in the end, we have to tackle the root causes, and that's production. Yeah, uh, and this is where I'm optimistic about AI. That's good to. I mean, I hope that's that's a. It feels like a very thoughtful response to the Joanna's kind of original provocation. It's it it, it's, it gets to the heart of this argument for sure. Um, so if I know you've got your hand up, I just wanted to give Lucy a chance to to say um what what she wanted to say about this issue of overconsumption and maybe perhaps also with in terms of energy grids, which I know is where your uh, expertise lies. Um, and then we'd love to hear from you at, at the end also. So. Yeah, um, it's a really, really good discussion. I love the points made by uh, Yakimo and Siraj. Um, I mean, I, I, I almost, it, it almost made me think of, um, I used to do a lot of work in transports and uh, there used to be heated debates between the academics about which was the lowest carbon mode of transport and uh, walking and cycling would often come out on top, but then you'd get really, you start going down and people say, oh, well, what's the cyclist diet? Are they a meat eater or are they vegan? And uh, and, uh, you know, it sort of made me think, well, you know, if, if I'm if I'm putting an algorithm out there that's encouraging somebody to consume books or something, what what activity might I be displacing by encouraging encouraging them to read? You know, am I stopping them from uh, taking their enormous polluting vehicle out and going for a mm. leisure drive? So so it sort of feels that there's, there's so many different angles here. And um, I think maybe from a sort of energy point of view, um, perhaps just to play devil's advocate a bit, um, and it's not necessarily my my uh, my full view. Um, I'm a big fan of Kate Raworth's uh, donut economics and thinking about um, consuming within sort of uh, thinking about keeping things within planetary boundaries. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think when it comes to energy, there's often a lot of talk about um, uh, reducing energy consumption, um, making things more energy efficient, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in, in general, I do absolutely subscribe to that. But I do also think it, we have to ask ourselves, why is that the, you know, in some cases, why is that the end goal? Because actually, I think you know, if if that if this is only a, this is only a, something we should aim for if if we have a circumstance in which energy is not abundant and in which energy is not green. And I think actually, if you have a system in which you do have abundant energy and it's clean energy, um, I'm not saying we shouldn't aim to reduce our consumption or make things more efficient. But I think actually we sh we should uh, really be 
just thinking about all of the different lenses here and um, yeah. uh, taking a taking a full system view. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so I, um, running really short on time, though, I'd love to um, hear very briefly from UCF and then um, give give Giacomo um, and Buffy a, a chance to um, to comment at the end. Yeah, of course. I mean, carbon pricing is one of my very favorite topics these days, right up there with Succession mm -hmm. Season 3. Uh, and I actually think that AI has a huge potential to unlock carbon prices that are unique to every company. And the reason I say that is if you look at the carbon tax in the UK, carbon tax in the UK are anywhere between minus £25 per tonne to around £128 per tonne huge variability and that size won't fit anyone really. Whereas if you look at company specific carbon prices, those should be a derivative of the company's uh, uh, targets, which uh, totally agree should be scope one, two, and three. Scope one and two alone won't get you very far. Mm -hmm. But then with that combined with the actual cost of transition, and that cost is gonna be very different for every company. So if you look at a, an average, let's say retailer, the cost may only be 20, 30 pounds per ton. If you look at a company like BP, the cost is going to be closer to 70 or 80 pounds per ton or even higher. If you have the misfortune of being in the coal liquefaction business, your cost is likely to be 150, 170, 180 pounds per ton. There's no way to get that one price to work for everyone. Right. But using AI, you can actually start unlocking the cost of transition, which consists of hundreds of thousands of micro interventions, build that up and actually get an accurate price for carbon that is company specific. Yeah. That's, a, that's an extremely interesting approach that we should definitely keep our eye on. Um, we do really have to wrap up. I want to give 30 seconds to Buffy, 30 seconds to Giacomo at the end. Um, should have seen this one coming. <laughs> okay, well, I guess um, my key point is, you know, the scale of the, the, the challenge that we're facing with gigatons of uh, carbon um, mm -hmm. we need to reduce is just huge and very much focused on um, immediate solutions that uh, AI can can achieve um, at scale, um, at speed. You know, action taken today is is better than action taken tomorrow, and we really need to focus um, and, and support those uh, those solutions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jack, I, I I would just say, like going back to the very beginning of this conversation, um, the, the the big opportunities that I see, let's say, you know, narrowly focused on machine learning, it, it is really around how it can enable the sustainability transition. And I think a lot of that is around, you know, taking physical processes and moving them into virtual environments, virtualizing them. It's around simulation and it's around, um, and it's around optimization. And um, yeah, there are a lot of, you know, I think the big cloud providers have to think about where they're drawing energy from. I think that, you know, the, the, the community that's developing a lot of the the algorithmic frameworks needs to be thinking about the sustainability of models moving to maybe lower mm -hmm. dimensional models. And, but individual enterprises are thinking about computational debt. And at the same time, everything that we're seeing around, you know, the move to never mind NVIDIA and GPUs and in, in, in enabling, let's say, hardware acceleration that way, but everything that's happening at the level of chip architectures themselves, like is also trying to enable scale, but also drive down, you know, the computational cost. Yeah. And therefore, let's say the energy, let's say the carbon cost of a lot of these models. So I'm, you know, David, I'm a little bit less concerned about like the level three point because I'm seeing AI really as a little bit like, you know, a pipe. And the, the fact is that for, uh, for, for uh, an oil and gas company, that pipe is going to serve a very different purpose. We might not be happy with the application, but I, I still see it as enabling the sustainability transmission, transition in so far as there are other mechanisms that are allowing for the load balancing, the optimization globally. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I still want petrochemicals, you know, to be accessible and within to be relatively affordable for the next 10, 15 years in so far as where everyone else is worried about, like, you know, in, inflation. Mm -hmm. um Right, I, we, I really, really have to wrap up. And uh, I, I, I'm i struck by a, a bunch of different things. And I can't thank all of you enough for, for weighing in and um, dealing with such a sort of whirlwind of, of different ideas and bits of content. But honestly, I think this has been one of the most interesting discussions I've I've uh, taken part in, in in an AI summit. I'm very struck by by the, the sort of different buckets into which AI applications can really make a move. Um, and Buffy, your point about doing this now rather than with some hesitation, optimization, visualization, simulation, sensing, sensing and measuring whether it's in uh, deforestation or, or elsewhere and finding new materials. Um, I'm left thinking that consumption isn't as straightforward as, as I might have seemed at the beginning of this debate, uh, particularly your point, Lucy, about, well, what goes into a particular type of consumption and, and um, 
Joanna's point about whether we do really need to reduce it overall. Um, different types of scope emissions in relation to calculations for a carbon price. Um, your point, CF, was absolutely brilliant. And it's something I need to go away and read about whether an AI application could be the key to unlocking the carbon price conundrum. Um, this was an infinitely complicated discussion. I feel like we've done a good job. Thank you so much for, for, for joining everyone and for the people who've weighed in in the chat. Uh, the, the Tortoise AI Summit will carry on uh, very shortly after this because I've eaten too much time. But thanks again, um, and I hope you are able to, to stick around. Bye.